Daryl Seligman, welcome back to the program. Hey, John, thanks for having me on again. Daryl, you made a, 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 an interesting discovery, to say the least, the third interstellar object ever, 3i Atlas. And this object has been causing a, a, a bunch of controversy, of course. of course. Interstellar objects, they, they, they all, they, everyone except Borisov caused controversy. And the thing about Borisov is that it was very clearly a comet. And at this point, it seems that a solid case can be made. The 3i Atlas is also a comet. It appears to have a coma. Now, you did recent observations, and these observations are interesting because they made use of the Vera Rubin telescope, which is in testing, but already giving us science. And there seems to be further evidence that it is indeed a uh, coma-producing comet. Tell us about that. Yeah, okay. So I guess the first thing that I want to say, just to clarify is that I think you're giving me a little too much credit. So even though I led one of the early papers about the preliminary observations of 3i Atlas, I was not the discoverer. And I don't know if you want me to get into the story of what I did do in those first couple of days, but it was- Go for it. Sure. Go for it. Well, tell us the story. Yeah, it was a crazy, it was just a absolutely crazy time. But so basically the Atlas team discovered the object, which makes sense. So the key people in that are Larry Deneau and John Tonry. Several, a lot of other, everyone else who works on Atlas and part of the collaboration, but John Tonry, who is a faculty member at University of Hawaii, basically built Atlas and got all the funding for it and had the inspiration to do it. And then Larry Deneau, like looking at the images, if you look at, I think it's the first figure in our paper, but those were the actual discovery images that he spotted the object in while they were doing routine. I think they were doing routine maintenance or something on the survey. So he, um, they found it. And what happened was the first night, I believe it was July 1st, maybe it was the night before that, but I basically was going to bed and there was like buzz about potentially another interstellar object, but nobody really knew what was going on. And that was right after Larry had spotted it, but the buzz was starting to leak out. And I emailed Karen Meech and Davide Farnokia and Marco McKelly. Davide and those are all people that I've done dark comet stuff with and people who are experts at tracking objects throughout the solar system for planetary defense reasons, but also mission planning reasons. And I was like, is this thing for real? Because like, it's pretty typical actually that we'll get an interstellar object scare. So we find something and it's like, oh, this thing looks like it's hyperbolic. And then we get a few more data points and it's like, okay, no, this thing is actually a long period comet or it has an eccentricity right below one or something like that. So I went to bed around 9.30 or something. I sent them an email being like, is this for real? And then I don't sleep very well typically. So I woke up at around 1 a.m. And to my like shock, I got emails from both Marco and Davide who are basically NASA and ESA's expert at this being like, this is for sure interstellar. And so I was just, uh, I was kind of in shock at first. Like I was like looking at my email and just like, there's no way we found a new one. And then I was just, it was like 1.30 in the morning. And I was like, well, I guess I slept like three hours, but there's no chance in hell I'm going back to bed. So I kind of like jumped up and I think I, I was just really excited. I couldn't decide, like my heart was just like racing. I couldn't decide what to do. So I went to Dunkin' Donuts and I got an extra large iced coffee. And then me and Marco was in Rome. At like, so it was like 8 a.m. for him or whatever when we were working. So I threw together like an overleaf, which is where we write the paper and started writing stuff. And he was, both of us were trying desperately just to get as many telescopes to look at it as possible and get the orbit better. And then it was just... For the next five days, we just kind of furiously wrote the paper and then everybody who was getting up, so many people who were getting observations started like coming, like, cause it, I guess news got out very quickly that we were writing a paper. So everybody just was trying to give us their data just so we could like include it in the paper. And so it grew to like over 50 people on the author list very quickly. Dunkin' Donuts has excellent coffee. I, I have <laughs> yeah. to point that out. That, that out, of the, out of the coffee availability market, Dunkin' Donuts ranks relatively <laughs> highly. Yeah, it was hilarious because we were like, yeah, I, that was like 1.30 a.m. So I got that huge like cold brew at Dunkin' Donuts. And then the next two days, it was Wednesday and then Thursday was July 4th, I think, or Friday. I don't even remember, but there was the long holiday weekend. So I just spent every, I basically didn't sleep at all for like six days and worked every minute that whole time and finished the paper and submitted it. Now, it was clear, though, from the very start in the early photography of this, that it it seemed to have a coma. Right. And and you would expect that. And there yeah. was controversy, you know, th there was controversy about, well, this object's very bright. 
for what it is, which that's relative. It is not very bright. <laughs> it's yeah. like 18th magnitude or something, but for what it, its distance and all that, it's bright, which would imply that it's large, but a comet's coma is large. Right. And if it's, if it's, it, you know, you, the, the nucleus is tiny, which is what you would expect. Small things are far more common than big things in the universe, but the comet's coma is, is big and reflective. It's like a cloud of dust and gas coming off the comet as it nears the sun and warms up. Now that seemed clear, but there would have been a problem if had it been an asteroid and had not exhibited this. Tell us about that. Yeah, you're exactly right, John, as always. So what happened, actually, I was actually exactly wrong. So what happened was, so we put the paper together and at very, so me and Marco McKelly, like, so we, we, we were, we wrote the paper super quickly. Right. And at first, like that for those first couple of hours, the first couple of days, really, I mean, everything blurs together because it was such a just like blur and I didn't sleep at all. So I was running on like no sleep, but I'm pretty sure the first couple of days there was no, it was not obvious that it was a comet. And so we thought it was inactive. There's also the, there's another important piece, which is that we know that solar system comets, like when they come in from the outer solar system, they don't always activate and by that, I mean like ice starting to sublimate and produce dust coma. They don't always activate until they get closer in. So you wouldn't even necessarily expect this thing when we found it, it was like 4.2 AU or something like that. So you wouldn't even necessarily expect it to be sublimating vigorously at that point in time. So we thought at first it was just an asteroid. So what I did was, I guess I had the first paper on archive. And so I what I had about the object. So what I had done was you take the absolute brightness that Marco measured in some of the first images. And you say, okay, if it's that bright and this far away, and you assume that there's no coma whatsoever, you assume it's an asteroid. And then you assume an albedo like other asteroids, which is like, well, I don't know, we guess like 0 0.05 or 0 0.1, which means 5% reflectance, 1% reflect, 10% uh, reflectance, something like that. That gives you a size of on the order of 20 kilometers. And so we kind of said, okay, if it were inactive, although we'd expect this thing to eventually activate, it's uh, the nucleus size is 20 kilometers, but that's probably an upper limit. And then it turns out, I mean, that's also a crazy size because if that's real, if that were the real size, that would imply a huge amount of mass in the galaxy in interstellar comets. So it would imply that on average, something like every star is producing on average 0.1-ish solar masses of it, of comets that they're ejecting. So that's like, that's a very high number because stars don't have that much material and metals or and what astronomers call metals. So that would be remarkable if that were the case. And you would see, you would see that difference in the stars themselves in their makeup. You would see that metallicity it would be anomalous. Yeah, it would be higher. Right. Right. Presumably. But we also, I mean, independently, we kind of know, well, if these are prod if these are planetesimals that form in protoplanetary disks, you kind of roughly know, not very well, but approximately to kind of order of magnitude how massive bit disks are on average. So it's 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 more massive than all the disks put together. So it kind of it if that were actually the mass that would potentially tell you that, you know, maybe these interstellar comets don't actually form around in protoplanetary disks, maybe they just form in situ in the interstellar medium. I don't know. But much more likely was that it was an upper, like we said, it was an upper limit and it would, had some cometary activity. But then somewhere in that span of like five crazy days, we got some images where you could start to see the cometary activity. So we're like, oh, right. OK, so we uh, kind of applied the asteroid. What This is the size it would be if it were an inactive asteroid, but it actually looks much more like a comet. So it's probably much smaller.